Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm happy to be talking a little bit more about a subject that I think is pretty important, and that is chronic illness and mental health. Now, mental health is a subject that I think is really important for everybody. But I do think that for folks navigating chronic illness, whether as a patient or as a caregiver, there are some nuances that don't quite resonate with other people. And so that is what I would like to spend some time on today. Um, as mentioned, my background includes working with nephrology patients um, in PEDS. And about a year or two ago, I decided to leave my position at CHOP and I started working um, for myself. I have a private practice where I, I really appreciate working with folks with chronic illness. Um, so I think I would like to start with a story. Um, shortly after I started working in the dialysis unit, we had a new dialysis patient and she was 16 years old. What brought her to dialysis, unfortunately, was the medication that she was taking for a completely different organ transplant. So this kid came to us with a story. She had had major operations. She had been in and out of the hospital multiple times, including some stays that lasted longer than a month. Lots of different medications, lots of different procedures, and so by the time she came to us on dialysis, we were able to observe pretty quickly signs of anxiety and depression. For her, but actually also for her mom, because for any of you who are caregivers, who are parents, you know that you are going through it with your child. So while this patient was spending a month or more in the hospital, mom was laying next to her in a cot. When this patient was in the OR, mom was waiting in the waiting room with bated breath. The family took our suggestion and they started seeing a therapist, which is great. Part of my job as the social worker was to liaise with community organizations. And so this family wanted me to talk with their therapist, gave me consent, and so I began coordinating with this outpatient therapist. This therapist was awesome, but it became evident that she, she really was not familiar with the medical world. She needed a lot of education. She didn't quite understand how medications or procedures or dialysis could affect mood or, or cognition. And I think the therapist was also a little bit frustrated because there are some traditional ways in outpatient therapy that we like to identify goals and go about problem solving. And those traditional um, strategies don't perfectly translate over into folks dealing with a chronic illness. And it was through that conversation, through that experience, that I realized it's different. That for folks who have chronic illness or who are navigating it in any way, need, need more personalized or individualized mental health care. So what I hope to cover with you today is first go over some mental health basics, and then I want to move into how chronic illness can affect our mental health, go over some nuances, some implications. And then finally, I want to offer you guys some suggestions for moving forward. Now before that, I actually want you to check in with yourselves for a minute, <laughs> um, because I'm a therapist and I like asking people to check, within, check in with themselves. But I know that you guys are going to a lot of different sessions over the course of this conference. And I'm guessing you're getting a lot of really great information. So if you have a pen and paper in front of you, I'd love you to just take a minute to reflect. Why did you decide to come to this talk? Is there information you're looking for? Do you have some questions that you might want to see answered? I'd like to take a minute and let you jot that down. People are still writing. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's jump in. There we go. <laughs> so I'd like to do an activity, and it's the type of activity that makes introverts the world over just really happy. Um, I wanna do word association, and I, I wanna thank the Neff Cure team so much for their valiant effort to make my vision play out. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to go old school here. I had been hoping to do like a word cloud, but we couldn't figure it out. So if you're an introvert, you don't have to participate. But what I would like to do is I'd love to ask you guys, what comes to your mind when you think mental health? It could be a word, it could be a phrase, it could be a few words. What else? Oh, ooh, very good. Support. Teenagers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hmm. Resources. Anything else? Ooh, I didn't hear that one. Balance. Yes. Fear. That's a big one. That's a big one. We do have microphones, by the way, if you want to shout. Depression. Mm -hmm. Stigma. Very big. That's a huge factor. Yep, access. There's a theme there. Access and resources. Yes. Oh. Yeah, relatability. Mm -hmm. Comorbidities. Comorbidities, yes. Especially, especially apt given this talk, right? OK, thank you guys. All of those were great. So I wanted to get a sense of what you guys think mental health is because this is a term that I think is used to describe many things by many different people. And so for the sake of this talk, I'd like to get on the same page. If this thing works. There we go. <laughs> so here's a definition. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. So again, I think mental health is used often to describe any one of these things. But I would argue, as would the CDC, <laughs> that mental health is actually the point of convergence of all of these things. All of these things need care. So mental health is super diverse. It's normal to experience a spectrum of emotions and feelings. And we all can probably think of a few people who, who their spectrum may be different than ours. We may have some more stoic friends or more effervescent friends. But it is normal to experience the bad and the good. And I would actually argue if we're not deeply feeling the negative or the bad, we're not able to deeply feel the awesome and exciting. There are a lot of mental health diagnoses. But today we're gonna to focus on three of the most common and well-known ones, which are anxiety, depression, and trauma. Like medical diagnoses, we use standardized criteria to establish diagnosis. We find this in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or affectionately known as the DSM-5. And diagnosis can come from genetics, biologic imbalances, or experiences. For example, we know that with anxiety and depression, there is a tremendous genetic component. Tremendous. With biologic imbalances, we're talking about our diet or medications we're taking or supplements that we're taking. These can all affect our mood and cognition. When we're talking about experiences, we're referring to those events that affect our brain in a way that it responds and might even shift in how it perceives. It might change some patterns things that might lead you to being more anxious or depressed. Now, unlike medical diagnoses, a few people mentioned this, mental health often carries with it 
significant stigma that makes many folks apprehensive about getting care, despite there being care available. We're making great strides, but there's still a long way to go in terms of the stigma. I want to start with anxiety. I might spend a little bit more time here than I should just because anxiety is so normal, and the majority of my clients have anxiety. Um, so just way too familiar with this. <laughs> so anxiety is so common that it's roughly one in three people. The NIH states that an estimated 19.1% of U.S. adults experience anxiety in a given year, and that an estimated 31.1% of U.S. adults will have an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. An estimated 31.9% of adolescents experience anxiety. And of course, since we are now living in a world post-pandemic onset, there's been a lot of research into how our collective moods have changed. And the World Health Organization has estimated that there's been a global surge of about 25% in cases of anxiety. So whenever I have a new client starting with me and they want to work on anxiety, I start with psychoeducation. First thing I emphasize is anxiety is normal. In fact, anxiety is a healthy mind-body function. When we think about what our brains are designed to do on its most primitive level, our brains are designed to keep us alive, to keep us safe. Its focus is survival. And anxiety is one of the main mechanisms our brains can do that. So when there is a perceived danger or threat, anxiety is triggered, and then our brain floods our bodies with two different hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. This sharpens our senses, and it makes our reflexes faster. This is fight, flight, or freeze. Now, when a perceived danger has passed, our body should return to normal. Our brain should be able to register the passing of the threat and say, it's okay, guys, we're good. But if you have an anxiety disorder, your brain doesn't necessarily do that. And so even though there is no more perceived threat or danger, you're still feeling scared, you're feeling wired, you're feeling hyperactive, hypervigilant. You'll feel really worn out and exhausted. Now, the more anxiety that we experience, whether this is legitimate or whether it's through a disorder, our baseline to handle anxiety changes. And so we'll notice that our capacity shifts and our ability to tolerate distress decreases. And so this might look like someone who's just anxious all the time, someone who has that tendency to anticipate worst case scenario, someone who's thinking, oh gosh, what if, or did I forget, or what will happen, even in the most benign situations. What's also interesting about our brains, keeping in mind that its job is to keep us safe, is that our brains are designed to catalog negative experiences, including anxiety. And so if you have a really negative experience in a particular place, let's take a doctor's office, for example. You get distressed, you get upset, your brain is triggering anxiety because it wants to keep you safe, it's sensing a threat. Subsequent times you go to the doctor's office, you're probably going to be feeling anxiety because your brain is saying, we've been here before and there was a threat. We've been here before and it was not good. Unfortunately, our brains do not have the same um, incentive to remember the good things. And so that's why it seems as though it's easier for us to remember the negative or look out for the negative and not the great stuff. So when we talk about how our brains can shift under anxiety, it can lead to, um, again, increased hyper-vigilance and hyperactivity to threats. Brain anatomy changes, which then leads to a decreased ability to process things rationally. Some symptoms of anxiety, I'm assuming many of us have had these. They include racing and pounding heart, change in breathing or shortness of breath, muscle tension, feeling hot, sweaty, changes in sleep, dizziness. And from an emotional standpoint, this can include poor memory, irritability, feelings of dread, avoidance, or fear of losing control. So now let's move into depression. So 
Depression is common, though we don't think as common as anxiety. The NIH reports that an estimated 8.5% of adults were diagnosed with major depressive disorder before the pandemic. And again, being a post-pandemic world, a study that was conducted in 2020 showed that depression rates tripled in light of COVID-19. Depression is a persistent feeling of sadness, loss of interest, and hopelessness. It often includes changes in eating and sleeping, in lack of energy and motivation, loss of focus and ability to concentrate, and a sense of worthlessness. In extreme cases, individuals may feel suicidal. Ongoing untreated depression, like anxiety, can affect the anatomy of our brain. So remember, with our brain, we have what's called neuroplasticity, which is really great. What that does is it allows our brain to respond, change, and shift. It can shift for the better or it can shift for the worse. But even when it shifts for the worse, you can shift it back. I want to emphasize this with depression again, that among the causes for depression can include genetics, stress, and chemical imbalances. This is not because it's your fault. It's not because you are weak. There are variables here that are out of your control. Let's take a look at a couple symptoms of depression. So we have trouble with memory, focus, or concentration, or what we would call brain fog. Loss of interest in things that you typically love. Fatigue or lack of energy. Physical symptoms such as aches and pains, including headaches and digestive issues. Those tend to be the more common ones. Feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, emptiness, and numbness. Disruptions in sleep and eating patterns. Increased agitation, irritability, and anxiety. Now there's something important with depression because you can raise your hands here or you can keep them down. How many of you have experienced any of these things? Yes, right, me too. These are actually really common symptoms. Sometimes I like to laugh at those depression commercials because they're like, are you sad? Do you need this med? We're, we're, we all get sad, That's, we're supposed to sometimes be sad. Um, so when it comes to talking about depression, it's not just about the symptoms. We want to know how many symptoms you're having at a time. We want to know how long you have been consistently feeling those symptoms. And we also want to know what's going on in your life at the time. So when I'm talking to a new client, I want to know, have there been any big losses, big transitions, big adjustments? Because this might be appropriate. If you were to imagine somebody who, you know, landed in the hospital and out of the blue find out they're CKD5 and they need to start dialysis, it would be weird if they didn't have these symptoms, right? We would expect them to be feeling this, and that would be appropriate. So when it comes to depression, it's very multifactorial. It's not just, oh, I feel sad, or oh, I'm, I'm losing some memory. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. So now we're going to talk about trauma. And trauma is, we're learning so much more about trauma. The research has been amazing. We're learning so much more about how trauma works. And this is leading to excellent and efficient treatment for trauma. One of the biggest things that we're learning is that trauma, what causes trauma, trauma responses, is not nearly as rigid as perhaps we thought it was even 10, 15 years ago. I'm of the belief that trauma can theoretically happen to anybody because a lot of it is dependent on your capacity at the time of injury. So what might be a traumatic event for one person may only be slightly distressing for another because it, it really depends on where you're at. So trauma results from exposure to an incident or series of incidents that are emotionally disturbing or perceived as life-threatening. This then has lasting effects on an individual's functioning and well-being. Trauma changes how our brain processes information and can change the anatomy of our brain. There's a theme here, a lot of brain anatomy changing. There are different types of trauma and trauma responses. The more severe or well-known type is post-traumatic stress disorder, which is PTSD. Trauma responses can include 
hypervigilance, intrusive thoughts and flashbacks, obsessions and compulsions, attachment issues or other relational dynamics, and extreme mood swings. Physical symptoms may be present as well, including muscle, uh, muscle tension, sleep disturbances, and aches and pains. Trauma is becoming so normalized that most non-trauma specialists are being taught what's called trauma-informed care. Medical providers are being trained in trauma-informed care. And I think that truly illustrates just how common trauma is. Now, if we're talking about trauma that is more disruptive or more significant, it is important to go to a trauma specialist. They have access to treatments that the rest of us don't have. Things like EMDR or neurofeedback or TMS. And these treatments actually target those brain anatomy changes we're talking about. It's really exciting. In fact, those same treatments are now being applied to the treatment of depression and anxiety with really promising results. We're also finding with depression, or I'm sorry, with um, trauma, that there's a genetic component to this as well, which we never really considered. This was first discovered in a study of the descendants of Holocaust survivors when grandchildren of Holocaust survivors were demonstrating trauma responses for no reason. And this is becoming a very interesting area of study. There's actually a great book. If this is something that interests you, the book is called It Didn't Start With You. It's excellent. So before we launch into this, if anything that we just talked about, which to be fair, we like scratched the tip of the iceberg, right? But if any of this resonates, if, if you feel like some of this is familiar for you or for someone that you love, I want to emphasize none of this is set in stone. There is treatment for all of this. There is support available or should be available. A few people mentioned accessibility over here. That could be its own session talk, accessibility of mental health. So when we talk about chronic illness, it can cause a lot of emotional reactions, including fear, anger, uncertainty, guilt, and grief. And all of these are normal, and all of these are OK. There are unique logistical challenges that come with chronic illness, and we'll go over a couple of those. There can be significant social implications, including and perhaps particularly within our own families, as roles are changing to adapt to an illness. All of a sudden, we're not just mom and kid, we're caregiver and patient. So like we did with mental health, I would love to know what your thoughts or what words come to your mind when we think chronic illness. There are microphones. Or you can shout if you're really loud. I'll start forever. Hmm. Sadness. Mm -hmm. Sadness. Fear. A struggle. Struggle. Fear. Struggle. Expensive. Expensive. Ooh, yes. Alone. Alone. Oh, yes. Missed work. Death. Death. Yes. Discipline. Discipline. Exhaustion. Unpredictable and exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Isolating. Isolating. Yeah. It's hard. It shouldn't be this way. But here we are and it's really hard. So now chronic illness is, understandably, it's a word that covers a really large spectrum, right? When we're talking about chronic illness, we could be talking about someone who is minimally impacted. Maybe they have to do an extra doctor's appointment a year. Maybe they have to take one daily medication. But then there's an entire spectrum that ends with our end-stage diagnoses or our terminal diagnoses maximum impact, maximum disruption. 
So chronic illness is another one that means many different things to different people. Now, when I work with folks, excuse me, when I work with folks who want to do work around their condition, both when I was working at the hospital and now in my private practice, of course, there's a whole lot of things that come up that want to be discussed, but I do tend to notice two common threads that most people are saying this is a problem. <laughs> the first is the unknownness of chronic illness. It's that sense of unpredictability. It's that sense of feeling out of control, like you kind of just have to sit back and wait, like someone handed you a bomb and you're not sure when it's going to go off. And then I also hear a lot about relationships, particularly within the family, how hard that is. Now, I came across a video. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the actress um, Sarah Hyland, um, but she has had a couple of kidney transplants. And this is a really great video um, that she gets fairly vulnerable in. And so, guys in the AV booth, could we, could we play this up until about minute four? I know many of you will not progress to the advanced state she has been in. But I think, I think she may be able to give some language to some of your experiences, or at least I hope it resonates a bit, if we can get it to play. Am I supposed to do something up here? Sorry, we're having technical difficulties all over the place today in my presentation. I'm really sorry, folks. Should we just skip this? Keep going? Okay, we will not be able to watch the video. I'm sorry, it's really good. I encourage you guys to look it up. We might be able to come back to it. Okay, okay. Um, but if you could just continue. Yeah. Absolutely. So again, if we can't come back to it, I'd encourage you to look it up because she gets very vulnerable around how her family dynamics have changed in light of being the dedicated, identified patient. So let's go back to the idea of uncertainty uncertainty <laughs> with chronic illness. I came across a really great quote, well, actually a really great article in the Harvard Business Review, which had a great quote. You may already know that threat leads to fight, freeze, or flight. You may not know that it also leads to dis decreases in motivation, focus, agility, cooperative behavior, self-control, significant uh, where, uh, my sense of purpose and meaning, and overall well-being. In addition, threat creates significant impairments in your working memory. You can't hold on to as many ideas in your mind to solve problems, nor can you pull as much information from your long-term memory when you need it. Threats of uncertainty literally makes us less capable because dealing with them is just not something our brains evolved to do. So this article was written in response to COVID, um, because, of course, with COVID, the entire world was in this state of chronic uncertainty. We were going day to day not knowing what was happening. Sometimes it felt hour to hour. And so now there's more research into what does uncertainty do to our brain. And I'm curious, do any of these things resonate with you guys? I'm seeing a lot of head shaking. Yeah, it's your brain. Our brains can handle some uncertainty. It's an unavoidable part of life. But when it's being asked to hold on to a lot of uncertainty, our brains really struggle. Oh, 
You can see me making all sorts of faces as I'm trying to get this button to do its job. Ah, okay. We need to go back. There we go. So I want to talk about some practical challenges, and I am going to acknowledge that you guys could probably come up with a bunch more than what I'm going to touch here. Let's talk about all the coordination you have to do. Think of all the doctor's appointments, and maybe those doctor, doctor's appointments lead to more subspecialty appointments. Then you need to co coordinate maybe labs with your doctor's appointment. Maybe you need to coordinate procedures or advanced therapies, or in many cases, they tell you when to do these things and then you have to coordinate around. I'm losing my, my, my PowerPoint. Um, so coordination is a pretty big deal. How much time would you guys say you spend coordinating around doctor's appointments? If anybody has an answer, I'd be curious to hear some numbers. <laughs> yep, sounds about right. <laughs> Another big area of coordination is medication management. How many meds do you guys take? Or how many meds do your loved ones take? And you have to figure out, are these in the morning, are these at night? Are these with food? Are they away from food? Do they have to be taken together? Do they have to be taken away from each other? And if you're a peds patient or if you're tube dependent, you also need to coordinate with most likely a specialty pharmacy, which adds another layer. But if someone were to ask me what's the most challenging part of healthcare, I would have to say insurance. And I heard a lot of sounds, so I'm going to ask what might sound like a facetious question. How many people here have felt victimized by their insurance company? pretty much everybody. <laughs> this is something we could spend all day on. Insurance is neither intuitive or clear. I remember as a social worker, so part of my job as a social worker was to interact with insurance companies, try to get things covered, try to help navigate this stuff. And I came away from a phone call feeling so defeated and so confused, and I thought, if this is my job and I feel this way, how much more for the normal lay folks who, who it's not their job? It might feel like your job, depending on how much time you're, you're spending on it, but it's, it's nonsensical. You have to figure out who's in network, who's out of network, what's your deductible, what's your coinsurance? Are they gonna cover this at all? Could I get reimbursed? If you're talking about medications, you have to think about, is this, is this medication a formulary or non-formulary? If it's non-formulary, is there some other medication you're gonna have to take instead? Doctors get very frustrated by that because the doctors are on the back end trying to argue with insurance companies saying, we want this med for a reason, stop saying it's not covered. This is what the patient needs. If you are using a DME company, or if you're working with a home health agency, who's contracted with who? It's so frustrating. I remember we had, because with kids, I'm not sure how it is in different states, but some states are particularly supportive of children with chronic illness and will provide medical assistance regardless of income and regardless of other coverage. Some don't. And so when I was working in Philadelphia, we had several families who literally uprooted their lives in New Jersey and moved to Pennsylvania where the coverage was more supportive. Like, how ridiculous is that? I mean, it seems ridiculous to me to have to uproot your life to ensure your child gets all the care that they should get. But this is insurance. And so we're not going to fix insurance here. I just want to validate for you, <laughs> this is a very big deal, very problematic. And I would love to hear your stories sometime, because I have some good ones too. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the social challenges and the social implications. Being the therapist, I would argue that the social issues are just as, if not more, impactful than the practical ones. 
for a lot of folks with, with certain diagnoses, and, and I would include CKD here, you don't have obvious tells. And so when people hear that you're sick, at least I've had clients come to me and tell me how, how much this bothers them, people come up to them and say, oh, you're really sick? Or you don't look sick. At best, that's invalidating or dismissive. At worst, you're being called a liar or attention seeker. It's not great. And so many folks try to um, pretend they're not sick around certain people. They don't want to have to go through one more time of explaining, well, this is what I have, and this is why, and this is what it means, and I have to do this. That's exhausting. People don't like to have to do that. This also came up a lot at CHOP. So again, with peds patients, it's incredible how many schools don't get it. And so that is another layer of frustration for both patient, the child, and the parents, trying to ensure that their child is getting the support and care at school that they need. Care needs may disrupt school or work. I'm gonna pull from another peds example here. I saw so many stories where Shortly after birth, a patient is diagnosed with a pretty severe form of kidney disease. They need special formula, they need special meds, they might need injections. And then paired partners have to decide, okay, who's going to quit work? Who's going to take this over? Even single parents. I had some single parents who had to move back home with their parents or make other really dramatic choices in their life because their kid needed to be cared for. And for these medically complicated little ones, you can't just go to a regular daycare. Most babysitters or nannies are not going to be comfortable doing the level of care that's required. You may be limited in where you can travel, take vacations, or move. I'm going to pull from another peds patient, a little bit more advanced, a pediatric dialysis patient. Older sister played sports. I'm not a sports person, some sport. And they got really far. And they were going to be able to go to like playoffs or something out of state. Now, if any of you are familiar with dialysis, you know if you're going to go on a trip, you're going to need to identify a dialysis unit in the place you're going to be. But when you're a kid, it's even harder because a kid can't just go to any dialysis center. A kid has to go to a pediatric center. And unfortunately, there were no pediatric centers anywhere near where the sister was playing. And so the parents were then faced with the choice, OK, who gets to go and celebrate this with our one child? And who is going to stay here with our other child who needs this life-saving treatment? So what happened was one parent and the patient had to miss out on a really exciting event for another person in their family. Care needs may dictate how you can socialize. This might be you not being able to share in a meal because it's not renal friendly. I had several clients when I was working at CHOP who hated the holidays. They're like, we, they don't make things for us. <laughs> I have another quick story, um, a dialysis patient. She was a 15-year-old, and she was on peritoneal dialysis. And just quickly, if you don't know what PD is, it's a type of dialysis that you do at home most, most every night. You're literally tied to a machine, and you do it all night while you sleep. This patient needed to be on her dialysis machine longer than average, and so she was hooked up to her machine um, around 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. So less than two hours after she'd get home from school. So this 15-year-old couldn't even go and have dinner with her friends. She couldn't go and hang out with her friends after school. And this led to significant depression, and she actually required advanced care, men mental health care. But who? Who wouldn't be at 15 years old having to spend more than half your day tied to a machine in your bed? So now we're going to go to family roles, how they change. Both caregivers. Oh, thank you. Oh, great timing. So we're going to go back to the Sarah Highland video. 
Let's see if I can get back here. I swear to God, this thing. Oop. Help me. <laughs> I'm going to need to go call my therapist after this. <laughs> Take some deep breaths. Everybody join me, won't you? <laughs> Thank you. It was the It was the worst and best year of my life. It started out horrific, and it ended with a beautiful beginning of not just a new chapter, but a new book. Scars are scars. They are little tally marks of what you've been through as a human being. About, geez, seven years ago, I had my uh, a kidney transplant. My dad gave me his. But what most people don't know is that about two years ago exactly, I went into rejection. <sighs> Saying that out loud is weird. Whoa, I don't cry. This is. <sighs> you know, when a family member gives you a second chance at life and it fails. It almost feels like it's your fault. And it's not. But it does. We did all of these uh, tests and um, all of these treatments to try and save the kidney, but they basically said the transplanted kidney was like a house that caught on fire. You can't unburn a house. So that's when it kind of sank in that it was this was a real issue. And that's when I started dialysis because everything just went kaput. I needed to be hooked up to a machine three times a week for four hours per session. And I'm such a crazy person, like workaholic, that I was like, I, okay, I'll take the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule, so only two days of the working week I have to do dialysis. And in May, May 10th, I had a nephrectomy, which is when they take the old kidney out. We still don't know what caused the rejection. It could have been a multitude of things. And at that time, I was very depressed. For a long time, I was contemplating suicide. I had gone through 26 years of always being a burden, of always having to be looked at after, having to be cared for. Okay. Because I've always had health issues. Oh, thank you. And it's a really helpless feeling. Things like this can be really hard on a person. I was on dialysis from February through October of 2017. In about July, we found out that my brother was the match. It was really exciting, but there was still a lot to process. When a second family member, someone who you're supposed to look after, like a little brother, wants to give you a third chance at life, it's scary because you don't want to feel them. I felt a lot of pressure to make sure that it was good. It was a crazy whirlwind we get. I'm cutting it off there. It keeps going. If you would like to see it, you can hear more of her story online. And again, if you don't recognize her, she plays one of the kids in the TV show Modern Family, which if you've not seen that show, you need to. Um, excellent TV show. But um, like I mentioned before, I really appreciate her vulnerability and her transparency. And, and I know that a lot of you are not going to get as far as her. But I hope that some of what she said resonated a bit for you. So back to the social challenges, talking about family roles. Um, 
like Sarah described in her video, that sense of almost feeling, for a patient feeling obligated or feeling like a burden, very normal. I had one mother I was working with closely and, and she came to me, she was crying, she was so upset. Actually, I think it was following an insurance issue. Um, and she said to me, oh my God, I just want to be a mom. I don't want to have to be a case manager. I don't want to have to be my kid's nurse. Why can't I just be a mom? I have another patient in my practice who came to me. They have ALS, advanced ALS. And they and their partner want to work with, wanted to work with me around how to redefine their relationship because as I'm sure many of you know, ALS can get incredibly debilitating and the person becomes dependent on whoever is taking care of them. But there's still this desire when it's between two partners to have that sense of romance, to have a sense of partnership, not feeling like one is inferior or, or at the mercy of the other. Again, very normal. And I think that is a, something that is very important to do work around because while it is normal, while guilt, shame, frustration, anxiety, depression, grief, and anger are all normal, you don't have to stay with it. But you do have to acknowledge it. It doesn't mean that you're being dramatic. It doesn't mean that you're wrong or being bad. These are all legitimate and understandable emotions. Acknowledge, address, and you can work on them. You don't have to stay there, believe it or not. So I mentioned several CKD examples, um, but let's go into a few specifics. I'm going to preface this. It is so essential to maintain open and ongoing communication with your nephrologist. Every case is different. You want to talk to your doctor about how your particular presentation and your medication may affect your mood and cognitive functioning. Because our mental health can be significantly affected by meds. Think about steroids, which is very common for renal replacement therapy when we're talking about transplant. We know that steroids can increase risk of irritability, agitation, almost manic-like episodes. And for folks who are on dialysis or who have any catheters, ana like, antibiotics are not unusual. And antibiotics can also have an effect on our central nervous system, which includes our brain. Both of these meds are essential. They are life-saving. But I think it's important to remember that you can have a proactive conversation with your provider and say, hey, okay, I know I'm about to start this course. What can I expect? Are there any known effects around this med or this med? What should I be on the lookout for? And if I see it, what can I do? Some congenital kidney diseases include developmental and cognitive comorbidities. I know this is geared a little bit more towards pediatric patients, but remember this. So when a diagnosis is being discussed, if there's a differential on the table, you get to ask as just, many, just as many questions about the potential developmental and cognitive stuff as you do the medical stuff. And finally, I know I'm stating the obvious here, <laughs> but there are significantly nuanced stressors that come with renal replacement therapy. We went over a few examples of the dialysis ones, but let's talk transplant. I genuinely can't imagine the stress that is connected with trying to figure out where your next kidney is coming from. If we're talking about living-related donor, going on the paired kidney exchange, doing the deceased donor, it's a lot. And so again, these are all normal expected responses, but you don't have to live with them. There are things you can do to help mitigate the intensity of what's going on here. So again, scratching the surface, all of this. I'm sure if I sat down with any one of you, you could expand so much more on how your particular disease is affecting and showing up in all areas of your life. But now what I want to do is I want to move into next steps. Like I said, my goal here is to give you guys some ideas or suggestions for, for experimenting when you go home. 
I'm not saying this just because I'm a therapist, but it is important to talk. Talking provides an outlet, external processing, and opportunities for normalization and validation. This can look like therapy or joining a support group or patient care organization such as this, informal support with other patients and caregivers. Maybe there's a few friends or connections you've made in your program and you try to get together every now and again for coffee. Maybe you have a few trusted friends and family members who you can talk transparently about what you're going through and they're not gonna ask too many questions or they're not gonna make you feel uncomfortable. They have the space to listen. Many people ask me about medication, so I am gonna to touch on it here. It is appropriate for many people. In fact, in mental health, we talk about something called combination therapy. Combination therapy is when someone is working with a doctor and medication and working with a therapist in therapy. And research has shown that combination therapy is more effective than only medication or only therapy. Now that being said, medication is not for everyone. And particularly when you have a chronic illness or when you're on a lot of other medications, it is essential that you talk with your nephrologist if you wanna know more about anxiety, depression meds, to see what would be appropriate for you. Now the next, building on, or working on building acceptance and flexibility. This is not the same as giving up. This is really, really important. There's actually a whole sub, um, where do I wanna use? There's an entire form of therapy dedicated just to this. It's called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, or ACT. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that. It's definitely gaining traction. The goal of building acceptance is that you learn to acknowledge and maybe even embrace, I know that sounds bold, acknowledge and embrace those things that you can't change. And what you do instead is you focus on that acknowledgement instead of trying to focus on avoiding the scary thing or denying the scary thing is there or trying to change or alter it in some way. You're just saying, there it is. There it is, so now I have to figure out what to do with it. And there's something very powerful about that. The next thing I wanna talk about is identifying where you can still have control. So this is a big thing, and I'm thinking back to some of the things that you guys shouted out, that unpredictability, you know, that sense of not having control, that sense of certainty, uncertainty. This is so pervasive in chronic illness, right? But believe it or not, there are still places that you have control. And when you can, like, I'm gonna say identify those areas where you have control, they don't need to be big. You're giving your brain something to focus on and something to anticipate and something that allows you to feel empowered and that you have agency. Again, this is really powerful. And I'm imagining that many of you have figured out some areas where you feel like you still have control. But here are some examples. Learn what your triggers are. Because when you know what your triggers are, you can build responses to them. You don't have to be at the mercy of the trigger. You can say, okay, I know I'm triggered by this, and so this is how I'm going to plan to respond when it happens. I'm gonna give you two examples here. I have one client who gets very triggered by the drive to her doctor's office. And I have another client who gets very triggered by the smell of the doctor's office and the smell of the hospital. So with the patient, around the driving, we came up with a plan where she could distract herself in a not unsafe driving way, but <laughs> where maybe she can find alternative routes, or maybe she can have a favorite playlist, or a podcast, or an audiobook playing. 
She also wanted to try to get friends or family members with her so she had somebody to talk to on the drive. For my client who had problems with uh, the smell, she decided she was gonna start going everywhere with essential oils, which I think is pretty on trend for most people, but she has her essential oils and she'll turn to that if the smell is getting her upset. Another way that you can learn to try to gain some control is learning to anticipate. And now this is not the same as anxiety, though they're, they can look similar. When I'm talking about learning to anticipate, it's looking ahead and based on previous experiences, making educated guesses about what could unfold. I'm gonna pull from the peds world again. I'm sorry, adults, you're probably so tired of this. Um, it is not unusual in the pediatric world for nephrology clinics or labs to be based within the hospital. And so we would often see kids coming to their labs or coming to clinic and then needing to be admitted right away. This caused a lot of distress both for parents and for patients. And so how could we anticipate that? How could we plan? So maybe before you even leave, you begin to think, you know what? This has happened before or we've heard other families experience this, so let's just, let's just make a plan in case this happens. Maybe we bring a bag. Maybe I set up alternative care, um, child care for the kids at home. Maybe it's talking with your child and saying, hey, this might happen. What are some things you would want to bring so that if you end up in the hospital, you'll have something? Just having that discussion will help prepare your child so that they won't be caught off guard. Maybe you're bringing work from work, <laughs> and maybe your child is gonna bring work from school. Make a plan and anticipate. You don't have control over where you might spend the night, but you do have control over how you will do it. Now finally, building plans for potential flares or relapses. This is another big one, particularly since nephrotic syndrome is one of those relapsing remitting diseases. I'm gonna talk about one of my patients who actually was diagnosed with POTS, which is another relapsing remitting diagnosis. When in relapse, she's debilitated. She's stuck in bed, horrible migraines. She's also a PhD student, so she feels unbelievably unproductive in these stages. She's a partner, she feels bad about not having food cooked. She feels kind of grungy because she won't get out of bed taking a shower. And so we talked about, well, how can you plan for that? If you know that when you're in a flare, certain things tend to be challenging, how can you plan for those things? So for this patient, we identified food she could keep in a basket in the pantry that would be super easy for her partner to grab, either for himself or for her. It was having audiobooks ready so that she didn't have to open her eyes, but she could still learn and, and be entertained. It was listening to some podcasts that were relevant to her area of study, so she felt like she was still engaging and participating in her field. She had comfy clothes specifically dedicated just for flares. Now I wanna talk a little bit with this in mind, with the idea of having grounding moments. Now grounding moments are things I think everybody should do. What I mean by grounding moments is that you're giving your brain something throughout the day to expect what's going to happen. So for those of us who are really busy or for those of us who have chronic illness and your day could look like one thing or the other, it's really nice if your brain can know, okay, this is all chaos, but I know at this time I'm gonna be doing this. Or at this time I'm gonna be doing this. Because remember, our brain doesn't like uncertainty. We're taking care of our brain by giving it a soft place to land and hang out for a little bit. And this can be anything. It can be, you know, your traditional meditation, prayer, or devotions. Or it could be having a phone call with a friend. It could be reading a book. It could be going for a walk. It could be anything. But it's the same thing consistently. For my patient, it was meditation. One thing she was really upset about was that she, when incapacitated, she couldn't go to her yoga area and meditate. 
she couldn't get out of bed. So we, we figured out, well, how can you meditate from bed? Which she had never thought of, but that really resonated with her. So now she knew that no matter how she was feeling physically, she would still have her moment of meditation every day, at the same time every day. It just might be in a different location. So think about that. What are some things that you might do now or things that you could experiment with putting in your day that can serve as that grounding point that you could do from anywhere? Think of the places where you feel really out of control and think, hey, what would it be like if I could just insert prayer here or reading a book here or listening to this podcast or this music here? Those grounding points are important. I swear to God. Here we go. <laughs> so I believe you guys have a bunch of handouts associated with this presentation. You may or may not have them with you. But in your handouts, you are going, um, going to see three different activities. I'm mindful of the time because I would love to give you guys some time to ask questions should you have any. So I'm just going to briefly go over what you'd find here. Talking about grounding, there's this great activity called 54321. In fact, you guys might have heard of it, but this is a winner. Therapists love this. <laughs> what you do is you find five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and something that you can taste. You can do this anywhere. And what this does is it, it gets your brain out of all the craziness up here, and it focuses your mind on the external, on the outside. And that's a really powerful thing when you feel like you're spinning or when you're out of control. You can do this as many times as you want, as often as you want, as many times in an hour. Remember when doing this, though, it's not about what you're focusing on. It's simply about the focus itself. So if you're thinking, what do I taste? You can taste the back of your teeth. There, nothing profound needs to be happening in what you're focusing on. We just want you focusing. The next activity is breathing. And most people have a love-hate relationship when it comes to breath work. A lot of folks feel like it does not work but you have to do it the right way for it to work. So for many people, it, depending on how they're breathing, it might not. We're not talking about just normal breaths. So one of the handouts is square breathing. And you'll notice that the pauses between your breaths is just as important as the breaths themselves. And I recommend for folks to do this four or five times, and you may have to do it multiple times over the course of an hour. What you're doing with this breath work is you're actually interrupting the cycle of anxiety. So if you think back to how our brain and body and those chemicals are, are running all over the place, taking deep breaths is a counter message back to the brain that says we don't have to fight, flight, or freeze. We're taking deep breaths. We're safe. It's OK. I actually encourage people to do this like regardless of anxiety level. Just like do it in the morning, do it in the evening, get in the practice of doing it. Because if something's a habit, it makes it a lot more likely that you're going to pull from it when you're in a moment of anxiety or crisis. Now, finally, the last um, exercise that's in your handouts is a body scan activity. And I love this. I encourage people to do this before bed if they tend to feel more anxious, tend to feel a little um, maybe out of body stuff going on. What I would recommend is that you get somebody you trust to read it to you while you do the practice, or what some of my clients have done is they've recorded themselves reading the exercise and then played it while they did it. This is another really great grounding activity, and it teaches you some of the stuff that's discussed in the ACT type of therapy, learning to just notice and accept. You don't have to change it, you're just noticing. That non-judgmental acceptance, and it's really important. So again, one of the handouts that you guys should have um, is actually covering the stuff on the right side of the screen, which is how to find a therapist and financial 
financial thoughts on finding a therapist. So I'm not gonna spend too much time there because you have that info. What's the purpose of therapy? I don't know how many of you are already seeing a therapist, maybe you all are, and for that I'm very, very happy. Um, I think therapy can be for everybody. You have to be ready for it though. There's nothing worse than someone going into therapy, they're not into it, they're not ready. You, you can only do so much. But the purpose of therapy is to give you time that's intentionally set aside for yourself. And when you're a caregiver, that's a pretty big deal because most of your time is dedicated to taking care of other people. And this could be some time where you're the one that's being taken care of. Therapy should be a safe and non-judgmental -judge, non place where you can work on your responses to things, how you're perceiving things, and to get guidance and support around these areas. A therapist's job is to create that space where you feel safe. A therapist's job is to provide you with insight or guide you through questions to help support you while you're figuring things out. The therapist's job is to help support you as you deepen your own self-awareness. Learn your triggers, learn how to handle those triggers and other things that might be challenging for you. It is not the therapist's job to solve all your problems, but it is the therapist's job to guide you as you find your own solutions. What you can expect in therapy is pretty standard. It is dependent maybe on what type of therapy you're doing. As I mentioned here, there's, there's several different types of therapy. It's almost comical how many types of therapy we've cooked up. Um, but at first you would have an intake where the therapist would be asking you a lot of questions, wanting to know you a little bit better, wanting to know why you're there, what you're hoping to get out of. They'll also ask you about goals. So that's something I love to ask new clients. Can you tell me some of the stuff you'd wanna work on? Now these goals could be something as small as, hey, I'm really anxious about this thing and I wanna cope better. Or it could be, I just need a place to talk and not get interrupted. If you don't have a goal identified when you first go, that's okay. It's also not unusual to wanna to try out a few different therapists. Therapists aren't like other providers. You wanna find a therapist who jives with your personality. That's really important and therapists know that so we will not be offended if you decide to go somewhere else. Therapy sessions are typically 45 to 50 minutes long and long-term therapy is known to be better particularly for folks with chronic illness. You don't wanna just do two or three sessions, you want it to be a bit longer. And while at first you'll probably be doing weekly sessions, with long-term therapy, a lot of my clients are actually every other week. So like I said, there are many types of therapy. There's cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. This is great when we're talking about identifying our thoughts and how they affect our behavior. We mentioned ACT. Motivational interviewing, which is great because it, it really tries to target on the why you want to change. And then there's traditional talk therapy, which tends to be a little bit more general, but pulls from different theories. So, I wanna say, again, I wanna be mindful of having time to ask questions if necessary. Um, am I pressing? We have questions, but before I turn it over to you, <laughs> I have two more questions of my own. When we started, I asked you to jot down maybe the reason why you decided to come to this talk or if you had any questions or wanted any information. And I'm curious if anything that came up in this presentation resonated with you. Did anything feel particularly potent? Jot that down, please. I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, 
So now that you may have thought of something, you've written it down, last question. I'm curious, are there ways, specific ways, that you can implement those things that resonated with you? Implementation might look like getting more research, reading a little bit more. It may be trying out some of the things that we talked about here today, or it may be something totally different. But I would love for you to take a minute and think about how could you specifically implement the thing that resonated with you? Okay, guys. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming to my talk. I hope that this was helpful. And now I would love to know if any of you have any questions. We have some mics around the room. We have one, Rebecca, back there. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> We have been on a journey of trying to find a therapist. My daughter has Medicare, and mm. we have a really, really good children's hospital. She still qualifies to go to the children's hospital. She's 19 now. Mm -hmm. But um, we're just, we have, we also have a social worker, but she's not quite doing what you described that you do. We get a generic list of therapists in the area. We get, you know, we've tried psychology today. We've tried everything. I was even just looking just now at some of the th sites that you suggested. Mm -hmm. And I swear, every, every time I come up with a therapist I think might work, they're not accepting new patients. Yeah. They, they're no longer accepting Medicare or they're no longer accepting Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, this is like a years long struggle. Her therapist that worked with her when she was, before she was an adult, still sees her, like, virtually. She wants to see somebody in person. So mm -hmm. what kinds of things can patients and parents do to advocate for a little bit more in the hospital? Mm. Um, the social worker is new in her position, and I know the hospital has case managers in other areas, but we just don't get it in nephrology. You know, I feel like they could be doing a little bit more in case management. Hmm. That's a great question. And there's a few different layers to that question. Um, so having Medicare is a beast. Um, it, it serves a lot of really great purposes, but I have spoken to many folks who wish they could have opted out of Medicare because there are a lot of limits. Um, many therapists do not accept Medicare. Um, so I guess my question to you is, would you be open to paying out of pocket and then getting reimbursement through, if you have any other insurance besides Medicare? We would, and we, my wife and I have even discussed, like, just paying for therapy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our daughter wants, I mean, not unfortunately, but she wants to be independent. She doesn't want mom and dad paying for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been kind of the the struggle lately, mm -hmm. she feels guilty for mm -hmm. us paying for things out of pocket when we have to. Yeah. So even if there's a possibility that we'll get reimbursed, we have to talk that through with her because I try to tell her and my wife tries to tell her, don't worry about it, we'll get it taken care of. But it's a big source of anxiety and sh shame and guilt for her to know yes. that even occasionally we are paying for things. Mm -hmm. Even though we tell her that's fine, we don't, we don't mind paying for these things, it's still an issue for her. She wants mm -hmm. to be independent, and mm -hmm. she can't work right now, mm -hmm. so. Okay. But yeah, you know, looking for something that we could re reimburse for later, maybe ease her mind a little bit. Yeah, that is, I'm finding more and more, that is what most people, if that's an option, should try to do. Because, for example, I do not take insurance, but I do give my clients what's called super bills at the end of each month so that they can submit that to their insurance, and then they'll get reimbursed the money that they paid me. 
more and more therapists are following that model because if you sign up to like actually work with insurance, it can, I believe it compromises the way we can practice. And so I would really encourage you to consider that if, if it's a possibility. Another thing would be if you find a therapist that does look interesting or that you'd be interested in trying and they are accepting new clients, talking with them about, about the financial issues. Perhaps you've done this, but lots of therapists have sliding scales. They like to work with families who have unique you know, dynamics going on. And many therapists will wanna work with you around maybe some of this. That might include working with your daughter to feel a little bit more confident in allowing you guys to take, you know, kind of take over here. When it comes to healthcare or behavioral healthcare in hospitals, that's a really hard one, and I'm, I'm sorry, I do not have a good answer there. <laughs> My hospital was the same way. We didn't have any behavioral health actually embedded in our nephrology department. Now, CHOP had its own behavioral health department, but our patients had to go to that department as if they were any other patient or any other child and make an appointment with that department, with that division, and be seen. And I know at CHOP, the wait list was pretty long. I'm, I'm not sure what it would be like at your hospital. I would say advocating, repeating this message back to your nephrology team. It is important to have behavioral health embedded in this team, I think is, is the best advice I can give you there. On a note to this young man, you might try, and I know she's transitioning into an adult, and with Medicare, Medicaid, unfortunately, as an adult, you don't get the same care like a child does. But check to see if they have a support group. I know that um, Emory University had asked my daughter to, to head up a support group at one time. Um, so. Sometimes that's a support group because the doctors are involved in those support groups at the hospitals. So that might be an option for you. Any other questions? No, it's great. No, that was helpful information. Oh, it's fantastic. Yep. You got him? Okay. <laughs> I'm full of questions today. Um, I live with PTSD from the military. Um, was diagnosed a long time ago. Um, I guess, how do you approach therapy in a mindset, or how do you change the mindset of how you approach therapy in reference to the goals you, have, you look to achieve from that? So, for instance, when I look for a nephrologist, I look for somebody who is knowledgeable, can understand the disease, um, and those kind of things. And they're not all the same, right? So when you go to a, a mental health professional and you talk about um, PTSD or post-traumatic stress, and I feel like there's a, an expectation, right? Like, how do I get this? How do I get this out of them, right? Hold on mm -hmm. a second. Um, how do I change that mindset? Because obviously looking for a, a, a mental health professional is, is, is the outcome is going to be a little bit different than what I would get from a nephrologist, mm -hmm. I would assume. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I feel like I need to learn how to change the mindset of when I'm looking for a mental health professional. So how do I'm, you do that? So if I'm hearing you correctly, your question is... <laughs> Um, how do you how do you find a therapist that that understands your particular constellation of, of symptoms? I guess I don't know. Hold on. He's always looking for uh, a way to fix things and an end result. Mm -hmm. And I often tell him sometimes just talking will help. You don't need to have an answer right now. And so I think his question is, how does he change his mindset to, to find a, a therapist where talking is the answer, that there is no end goal here? Mm -hmm. And perhaps there is, we just don't know what that looks like yet. Mm -hmm. I think, too, if I can just 
interject. I think that one of the big things, Dan, that you're getting at is that um, you live with a chronic illness and it won't go away. Some people seek therapy and there's like a goal. Like it's like, I need to get to here. I need to get through this thing in my life. And can you help me get through this thing? But this thing that we have, right, is forever. Mm -hmm. And so that it, it's a different mindset. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, and going back to Mr. Holshu, you know, his comment, you know, finding the therapist, the cost of it, I think, talking to the therapist about the situation and letting them know I'm not just here for like six sessions mm -hmm. <laughs> like this thing that I have is like forever I'm looking for someone to collaborate and partner with to help me through my journey not mm -hmm. just to get me through <laughs> the next two months or does that make sense it, it makes complete sense I mean my, the my experience has been um, in the VA healthcare system when they approach PTSD, um, I feel like they try and make improvements in treatment, but it's more like, here's a phone number when mm. you want to kill yourself, like call this number. Yeah, yeah. And then it's not really like a treatment. It's not really like a lot of help. It's, it's just like we have avenues that you can go down when you feel a certain way. Um, or take these drugs so you don't feel that way anymore. Yeah. And we kind of just cover it up. Yeah. So um, I hope I'm going to answer this question from a few different angles. So it sounds like what would be really helpful for you is, and for all of us, quite frankly, is finding a therapist who is familiar with your circumstances, right? Um, on websites like Psychology Today or Zen Care, you get to read the biographies and any certifications that therapists have had, um, what their areas of interest are, what they're experienced in. And I think once you're connected with a therapist, keeping in mind that if it doesn't go well, you don't have to keep going back. It can be frustrating when that happens because it feels like you're just making more and more appointments and it's like, you already have no shortage of appointments to keep track of, so it's frustrating. But you want to find somebody who, who gets it, at least to an extent. No therapist is going to know everything. But someone who gets it and who can help you tease apart, okay, what is the stuff here that, yep, talking about it is the best thing we can do, but who can also say, actually, there are some practices over here, or I might want to connect you with someone who does neurofeedback, for example someone who does TMS work, because that can help with it over here. 